right, I'm assuming you're all here for student council? Yes. That's great. When we start, will you guys introduce yourselves? That would be awesome. Um, agenda revisions? Public comments? Um, I actually, maybe I'll, I got two letters, one from a gentleman named Richard Maisel from Tallis expressing dismay over our vote of the lawsuit, and I can just pass the letter around. I, um, he wanted each of our responses, and I told him to watch the video, and he did, and then he responded again, and so I'll just pass that around. And then I got a letter from um, Woden Teachout, who was on the Rumney board, expressing concern about a procedure that or it's sort of an operational procedure that the school is not open on Sunday, and she's concerned about that. There was something that went on. And um, I think what I'm just gonna say to her is that the athletic director, if he needed something to happen on Sunday, he can do that. There's nothing preventing him from saying, I don't know, if you know, the field flooded on Saturday and they had to play a game on a championship game, he could do that. So was I'll- that, Was that the nature of her concern? It was, the, the initial concern was something about a middle school um, cross country championship that wasn't VPA sponsored on a Sunday. And so the school said, we don't do events on Sunday. So I'll just pass those two around. And you guys can read them and then pass them. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of October 24th? So moved. Karen and a second. Carl, any comments about them? I have two. I have two too, but let's see if um, the same ones. So on page three of the packet, <clears throat> about halfway down, um, after the bold part, the paragraph starts, Adrian McGee invited comments, and then it says, Tim Frazier stated that he believes if a separate flagpole was provided for other flags, that this would be an issue. This would not, would not, not, be, not be an issue? That's I what got I that too. It yep. not. Yep, would be right. Do you see that? Ten twenty four. I have it written here if you want. Them. Section three point three. Okay, thanks. And there is some bold, he's right. Okay. Right, you just yeah. need to put oh, not in. Sorry. Yep. Yes. Okay, and then the other was um, the next page. Um, Near, near the bottom, the section that starts discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would rewrite that to say that Kari disagreed that we have an obligation to defend the alternative governance structure proposal. Um, many of us voted for it initially um, in, to express unity with the collective board. That that. And then that is fine from there. It's fine, fine from there after the, the unity with the collective board. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All set? Yep. And then on page two, almost two thirds of the way down, you just misspelled my name. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> So 3.2. Oh, it's just, the yeah, no, there's an A at the end of 7 eight. They're not a big deal at all. Anything else? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. We have the student council here this evening, which is wonderful. We love having students come to our meeting. So why don't you guys, you want to pull your chairs forward? And I think we should go around and introduce ourselves before they start, and then they can introduce themselves. And Matthew, if you want to come up, feel free. We don't want to leave. We don't want to leave you out there alone. So why don't we just go around? We'll skip these guys because you know them. Do they know you? I think they know. Carl. Carl Whitkey, I'm the Worcester representative. 
Hi, I'm Kari Bradley from East Montpelier. I'm mean, Adrian Megida from Middlesex. And I'm Karen Bradley from East Montpelier, and we are not related. <laughs> Karen and Kari. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, start with I'm Andrew Compton, I'm a senior. I'm Lucy, you guys know me, I'm not a senior. I'm Kale, and I'm a freshman. I'm Bruce, and I'm a sophomore. I'm Jesse, I'm also a senior. I'm Evan, I'm a junior. I'm Maddie, I'm a junior. I'm Eva, I'm also a junior. I'm Waylon, and I'm a junior. Okay, so thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, hang on. Hold on. Okay. Andrew, if you want, you can turn the lights down just so there's a dimmer light. So if you want to dim them just a little bit. Yeah, look at that. Yep. All right. In 2013, when Act 77 was passed, schools of Vermont were committed to years of hard work um, to develop the philosophy of proficiency-based learning into a functional system for education. Since then, we have come a long way with many headaches and long days. But as a result, we are constantly making progress towards that better system for learning. Throughout this process, the administration has been exceptionally receptive of student feedback and involvement, which we are always grateful of. In this time of constant flux, it takes the cooperation, patience, and trust of everyone for constructive change. We truly appreciate everyone for um, appreciate the work and effort being put in every day behind the scenes to move toward a better future. Thank you for allowing us time to ask questions and do feedback. So now on to that. We are still deep in the developmental process and there are concerns that need to be addressed for the class of 2020 and beyond before scheduling the February. Um, so these are sort of the main issues that we've observed amongst students. Um, mostly there's just sort of a general sense of confusion despite the work that the administration is doing behind the scenes. A lot of kids just don't really know what's happening. Um, so the three main concerns from a student's perspective are GPAs and how they're calculated under the new system, uh, the discrepancies between departments regarding like um, how many times you need to achieve proficiencies in different things and what that looks like, and then also um, the main one is graduation requirements and standards. Kids are just sort of generally confused about what it means to graduate. So for students, we found there's a lot of confusion among students surrounding their GPAs. Many students are still unaware of whether their GPA is going to be calculated and included in their final transcript. So for the class of 2020, a letter will be included in each student's profile so that colleges understand why GPAs for this class may be lower. While this is a fix for 2020, it should not become the norm for future classes. In speaking to a student at CDU where they are also trying to incorporate the proficiency system, we learned that their GPA is calculated quite differently than ours. Students graduating from CBU are able to obtain a 4.33 GPA on their final transcript, while students at U32, it's nearly impossible to achieve a 4.0. While we can't make comparisons to every school in Vermont, as we're not all the same, we will be competing against them while applying to colleges. Although colleges use GPAs to compare us to other students at our school, GPAs can also be a factor between the size between two applicants as well as for scholarships. Especially since transitioning from the previous grading system, a 3.0 GPA does not appear to reflect the work and effort that the student has done to achieve that grade. In the future, it's important to develop a system in which students can have competitive GPAs. Great, so um, last Monday, some people from student council met um, with the heads of departments here in grade two, um, and we asked them questions about like what they believe for their department was like the um, the standard for amount of times we have to meet the course requirements, like how many times we have to meet proficiency in that course. And we found there was a lot of like discrepancies between these departments um, and even in the departments. And we believe that for proficiencies to work here at U32, um, students should be able to know exactly what's required for them in each course. Um, and we can do that by standardizing each course, not necessarily to make them all the same, but at least make them the same for the course. So. and graduation standards. Currently, the path to graduation, especially for the class of 2020, is very unclear. Students do not know which graduation standards they still need to graduate and what classes have or will test those standards. This needs to be communicated to students before they make their schedules for next year so they can know or can plan out their schedule so they can graduate. 
We risk more students not graduating if they do not know what they have to do. Um, also, students sort of don't know and teachers don't know what's going to happen if kids don't meet all 41 standards and that's been a thing that uh, we've been talking to Steven about and he's been super helpful in sort of providing information about what he knows right now, but teachers in the departments also don't really know what's going to happen, so it's sort of important because it's inevitable that some kids aren't going to meet all the standards and we need to figure out what's going to happen if they don't. Yeah, and some of the possibilities we've been talking about are being able to demonstrate to a small group of people, including your TA and the teachers in certain courses, to determine whether or not the student has or has not met proficiency or the possibility of some summer school classes. Or outside projects that can go before that panel that we talked about. Any questions? That was sort of more just us sharing our concerns about proficiency as a student. <coughs> On the slide before, you said that, uh, I mentioned unrealistic standards. Could you say a little more about that? Where it says, yeah, It's just the general feel from students is they're getting bogged down with having so many, having to hit so many of the standards, um, both transferable skills and from the student learning outcomes. So it's basically just that students don't know where they are currently, so they can't accurately say if they're on track to graduate. And the bar has been raised quite a bit from having like just an average of a D in all classes to being able to be proficient in these 41 standards. Yes, we all agree about that. <laughs> yeah, we know that. <laughs> Any other questions? When you talk about GPA, are you getting, I know you're getting, you're on a proficiency scale and three is proficient and four is above proficiency. Are you getting grades for content and grades for transferable skills? For GPA? For a GPA? It's just your course grades. Yeah. So the GPA is just your course grade? Yeah, it's not specifically a transferable skill, if I'm correct in saying that, or a student learning outcome. It's basically the sum of your performance. You want me to clarify? Yeah. <laughs> so so um, course grades are calculated from the content standards? not the transferable skills, and then the course grades are used to average a grade, a grade point average. And so um, transferable skills are reported separately for every class on a report card, and they are reported as a, um, well, they're consolidated into a score for the uh, transcript. So the transcript will show student scores on all 41 standards, and when we say 41, that includes the six transferable skill standards as well. And so when you guys say you can't, it's almost impossible to get a 4.0, what does that reflect in terms of grading? It's just we found that there's a really challenging dimension. Like, we all know that it's harder on this new proficiency scale than it was to graduate with the ABC scale. Um, but it just, in a lot of classes, the level that you have to hit to achieve a 4 in each standard has been raised. And then in order to get a four as your class grade, which is what gets calculated in your GPA, mm -hmm. that's even more challenging as you need to hit however many standards to make that three. You need to have more fours in your standards than threes total to have your course grade flip. In each, in each individual course. In each individual course. And so a lot of the time kids will be kind of in the middle, they're gonna fall at like a 3.5, they're gonna fall at 3.2. Um, but that, doesn't necessarily give an easy opportunity for the 4.0. It's just you would have to get a 4 in every single course to get that 4.0, which at the moment I don't know a single student who's even close. Can you get a 3.5 or is it, either, is it either a 3 or a 4? A 3 and a 4 for your class grades. For, on your report yeah. card, so that's all it'll show. Yeah. So if you're at a 3.9, it still no, shows it's a 3. Shows no, 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 it, that rounds up. So in the calculations, it will round up at a 0.6. So okay. a 3.6 rounds up to a 4. Um, uh, on course grades? On course grades. Okay. Yeah. So if you average the standards and it came up a uh, 3.6 or higher, um, then it rounds up. And so do you know how CVU gets a 4.33? So there's total, so for their classes, they get graded again on the 1 through 4 scale. Um, that then can, gets 
converted back to ABC grades for their final transcript. So, so it's like this year. It's right still no. the, for their graduation requirements. It's still based on a credit system, so they have the proficiencies in the classes, but then their GPA and final transcripts are basically the old. And will that stay past 2020? Mm -hmm. That's what they're doing for the class of 2020. I'm not sure what's going on. Here. Okay. <laughs> that issue existed prior to proficiency, right? That some schools have a, the top is a 4.3. Ours was a 4.33. It was. So if you got an A plus, you got a 4.33. If you got an A, you got a 4.0 in the old system. And and I would say that for other schools, so, so nationally. Grade point averages are calculated in a variety of ways at most schools. So there's everything from a zero to four scale. There are zero to five scales where four to five is used for honors or AP classes. There's weighted GPAs. There's a lot of different ways that GPAs are calculated. Uh, even within the state of Vermont, there's multiple ways that they're calculated. And that's, I mean, that's why the school profile is actually really critical that right. you've been work that administrative teams have been working on here for explaining that to universities mm -hmm. of what what the school does. And uh, it's been 20 years since I worked in a university, but every university had a conversion system to bring everything back to a norm <coughs> reference. When I mean not like a norm reference in a bell curve, but it's a norm like they knew how to compare across schools because schools have been doing different things. There isn't a consistency between high schools. So they do that at the college level. No, I've actually worked in a system that used a thing called quality points. They didn't even calculate a GPA, and it was a quality point system on a 16-point scale. Um, and then they reported quality points. I, I never, honestly, I worked there for a year, and I never understood what they were doing. <laughs> um, That's yeah, and so. So I'm hearing concern that kids used to be able to get a 4.0 or 4.3, and now it feels like it's not possible to do that. And that's. And the concern is that the colleges will look at that and say, oh, they could get a 4.0, it's a possibility, and they're not. Therefore, they're not as strong a student as maybe you feel like you guys are. Yeah, or even if you're not looking necessarily at GPA, you could just look at your course grades, however, if GPA is calculated differently by each school. If you just look at the total number of course grades and the number of threes and fours each kid got in those classes, I just feel like sometimes that isn't necessarily reflective of the amount of work kids are doing. And we have a we have a fixed graph for the class of 2020, which is basically a letter explaining, um, you know, what what like the top maybe quartile of um, students GPAs were in the school, so we can compare, um, you know, like the top level of GPAs in the school. Um, but if this if this continues, it's not really it wouldn't be the best. I would suggest either. Uh, grading, having the grade point average be uh, curved, or either, or either that, or just having the cutoff be maybe on like on a different scale instead of a four point scale, or maybe it's just convert converting back into better grades just for the GPA. I heard something. I okay. um, also the com uh, communication aspect. Um, It'd be great if this was communi communicated to some of the students. Um, just even if it's an email to the TA saying this is how it works, um, just read this tidbit to them, and then if they have some questions, here's some more detail. Something like that. It, because people have no idea. I was, I was asking TA like, different questions about how GPA is calculated because people don't know. And many people aren't asking questions even though um, you know, because we're more focused on the academic side of stuff than the, we're not representative for the whole student body. And so other people are going to be asking these questions as well. And so um, they just don't know. And I don't think that's right. I heard an interesting comment. When, when schools switched to proficiency, the hope was that the bar would be raised and that kids would have to learn more in order to graduate, that the reflection of A's and B's and C's didn't necessarily reflect what they knew and were able to do. It took into consideration how hard they worked, whether they handed their homework in, whether they participated in discussion as opposed to being proficient in the subject. And so there's a difference now between working hard and being proficient. And I think that's where some of this is, I'm working really, really hard, I got all the stuff I got to do, but what they're measuring is proficiency. And it, it's a huge mind shift, and I'm in education and have worked in the Harwood District 
Um, and it's just this huge mind shift to, it actually doesn't really matter how hard to work. It's what you can show you know in the end that's really important. And so it's something to keep in mind, but it's hard, it's really hard to be, to be thinking that way. Yeah, and I'd say also just for the for the four aspect, not for the three aspect, but um, that that teachers kind of treat a four differently for different um, teachers of the subjects. A uh, four can mean simply more work at a level of a three, or it can mean higher level of work. So there's not really a consensus on what a four looks like, which is in itself a really hard thing to decide. And I think with more professional development and more time and more communication that's going to become clear. It's, it is. It's really hard. It's right. really hard to get consistency, we, even within departments. And, and I think in fairness to the kids, the, the definition of a four has been a really hard thing. Like, I mean, they're, they're correct. That's one of those areas that is, um, that's just been very difficult. I think what we, um, we also, you know, I've talked about with the kids and with teachers is that we didn't really define an A before. And, and the relationship between an A in one class and an A in another, we just assumed because we've been using those letters and that, that the amount of work or the level of expectation was the same. But I can probably ask any one of you guys that an A, you knew how to get an A in one class was sometimes more difficult than getting an A in another class. Mm -hmm. and, and so we had the same issue, we just didn't talk about it before. And so, um, so now we're having to talk about it, which I mean, I think in, you know, for you guys, we need to kind of sit down and say, okay, what's the first message that we need to get out and what's the next one? Like, how can we start getting these messages out in tidbits that people can digest, right? Because this is a lot of stuff. And, and I, I think that you guys are, you're just now kind of getting the overwhelming part of it that our teachers felt two years ago when we first laid it on them. Um, you're now seeing like, oh my God, this is a, is a huge change. And so, uh, I mean, I know, I, I know a few, we, we spend a, every week together um, with them asking questions. And so it's helped us move forward and do all that. And I would just say some of the things that are happening right now, and I, I think that um, Lucy and Jesse heard this the other day with the, uh, with the department heads, is the criteria for graduation is one of our highest priorities. We want that available to kids. And the, um, the other piece of that is where are they on that continuum of 41 standards of, of meeting those because we don't think it's next year that they have to start worrying about schedule. We think it's next semester. And so we want to make sure that by next semester, kids are, have their plan kind of in place. Like if I don't have these proficiencies, what do I need to do next semester? What do I need to do next year? And for us as a school, what do we need to do in the summer? Um, because we don't want kids to be at a disadvantage in all of this. And so. I know, like, at the beginning of the year for seniors, they gave us, like, a sheet with, like, the mm -hmm. classes, like, let's say you have taken financial aid or something. I think if you guys, like, gave out something like that for proficiencies, like, oh, you're missing, like, a science proficiency. Mm -hmm. So that kids could know. Right, it's like, which, which standards have not been demonstrated proficiency or have almost been demonstrated proficiency, and then which classes yeah. test those certain so like standards. Like, what you were talking about at the department head meeting with the template thing mm -hmm. would be really helpful. Yep. Yeah. Are you looking for something from us, or did you just want to kind of inform us and have a conversation? We're just informing and having, having a conversation. Okay. And continuing to work with the administration to okay. get like, the details I know. I really liked your presentation. I liked how you kept it simple. A lot of times with PowerPoints, people load it up with all this different information. You just keep, keep it nice and simple and understandable. And I'm assuming that the um, problem, the issues with the curriculum are being hashed out as far as the statistics standards go for next year? Yes. So, um so what Evan's bringing up is that one of the things we're seeing is while we have 41 standards, did we really teach all 41 of them and give students the opportunity to see all of them? And we, as we saw last week or two weeks ago when I did my presentation, there are some that are neglect, really. So statistics is one of those. Um, engineering in science is another one. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves a, a hard question about the class of 2020 is, do we hold you responsible for something we didn't teach? I think we're probably going to have to have a conversation with the board about waiving a couple of these aspects just so, that, you know, if that's necessary for us. I mean, it's, it's kind of part of the, that's our fault 
for, for not getting that into the curriculum fast enough. And it's part of the process. It, you know, it is? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. But we weren't teaching engineering before <laughs> either, right? So that wasn't a part of our, our coursework. So now we at least acknowledge that it's there, not there and we can start building it in. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. It's always wonderful to hear from students. You guys are very articulate and thoughtful, and we really appreciate it. And you guys are why we're here. <laughs> so thank you very much. You're welcome to stay, or you can go home. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Oh, hey, uh, you guys, I'm not here tomorrow, so don't come to call back with me. <laughs> You good? Can I log off? That's what I'm asking you to do. No, you can log off. Do you have a general idea of one of the first drafts for the, um, for the number of uh, demonstrations are? Uh, like when that's going to be kind of figured out for each department? You're talking about the criteria? Yeah, just aren't you sitting down? And yeah, we actually have our first drafts right now, and oh. we're just going to sit down and look at I, I'm going to bring it to you guys next week okay. to start looking at. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. That was great. Thank you. Um, Who's speak to us? <laughs> I will start, and then uh, Stephen's going to fill in a lot of blanks that I can't remember. How about we say that? <laughs> to be Thanks, totally Bill. transparent and honest. Um, the, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk before we went over a specific budget was the process of the budget. With, uh, with waiting for the state board ruling on Act 46 right now, um, it, it's a little... We're in a little bit of a transition period about who has authority to approve a budget and send it to the electorate. If there is a merged, uh, assuming merger happens, there would be a transition board, which is formed of the clerk and the chair, as you've heard in previous meetings. That transition board puts together a recommended budget to go to a new seated, a new elected board past town meeting. That would mean that there wouldn't be a budget vote at town meeting day, and that there would be a special budget vote somewhere in the spring. The AOE currently in their draft articles of agreement is suggesting that that gets done by May 1st. Um, one of the things I, I've talked with the finance committee about, and uh, one of the things that I've talked to all board chairs about this, and I'm talking with all boards, is trying to keep the budget process as transparent and open and feedback happening. Um, so when we talked at the Finance Committee on Tuesday, uh, one of the things that we want to do is keep having a uh, budget meeting, talking about the budget here at this, uh, at the U32 meeting, because one of the things that we're trying to figure out, the new, trans, the new board will have authority over fiscal year 20, and that's what we're building a budget for. So what we want to be able to do is uh, we'd like to be able to gather feedback and gather information and we'll probably adjust from your feedback and then be able to give all that to the transition board who then gives all that to the new board. Another way of saying that is that um, we kind of want to follow the process that we've used in the past depending on how things work out. But we may end up being advisory to the transitional board saying here's the work we need. That, that's a better, more concise way than I say it. All right. Can you write that down? So, that. <laughs> so one of the things that um, when we started budget development within the administration, I asked all the principals to bring a budget approximately 3%. I want to give you some information. And Kari, I, I mean, I did this with finance, so I don't know if I'm kind of walking on what you wanted to do. No, nope, go ahead. Um, so some things that we, we actually looked up Tuesday. Karen was asking me at the table, which I thought was great. The consumer price index for September 2018 overall is 3.3 percent, and for for New England, this is these are New England region, okay, and for schools and government, in particular, it's 2.9 percent. That's and that what that is is 12 months, a 12 month percent change. So it goes back to September 2017. So if you look on page five of your packet, or six of your packet, you'll see the overall summary of the budget. And as we talked about in previous meetings, um, we were bringing you, the first budget's a level service budget, which means we're basically bringing you a budget if we were to do everything we're doing now, for the student needs we know, what would the cost of that be in next year's budget? No changes in staff, 
no changes in programming. So the total of that is 3.13%. Um, in some years, I've walked you down through this. Um, most of, I know the four of you have seen this before, this type of layout, so I don't know if you want me to walk you down through it or if you just want to ask questions that are here. Some of the biggest things is, that I would point you to is you see the Washington Central Assessments for Operation Special Education and Student Transportation. Last night, the, that was based on a 3% increase. Uh, last night, the overall net impact increase for Washington Central at the Executive Committee was 1.96%. Um, so those numbers will change. Um, and then up above was all the stat is just is really the, the the big piece is that health insurance is increasing 11.8 percent, and we have our salary increases at a, a point that we're targeting. If you remember this year, we're in negotiations. So, just one clarification, Bill. Mm -hmm. said, um, no level service, no change in staffing. That's not quite true. This does include a decrease of two paraeducators and then uh, some, an increase or partial increase of um, professional staff, teacher staff um, for the al alternative program. Right, but that's something that we've already done this year. Okay. And the 2.0 we've already done this year as well. Okay. So it's, right. it, it, when we do this, that second grouping, thank you, Kari, is comparing last year's budget to this year's budget. We've already done those changes for this current fiscal year, so I should have so been why clear are on that. Because what what happens is the way Lori do, takes a look at everything, she does when we do a budget and we do a what's changed in the budget, the denominator is last year's budget, not this year's projected where we're going because we don't mm -hmm. have this year's actuals. So every year oh, that okay. we've done that change, okay. that change is a percentage change based on budget not based on this year's actuals, next year's budget, because we don't have this year's actuals. But, okay. So those were actually two positions that we'd budgeted for for this year, but we left those positions open. Um, so in last year's budget, didn't we cut two, for this year's budget, didn't we also cut two pair educators from last year? I would, I, I'd have to go back. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't. I, I, thought, I thought we had it. I, I'd, have to, I'd have to go back okay. and look. There was something with two anyway, pair educators. My main point okay. was that this is more in keeping okay. with the best practices that we learned about. Right. Yeah. And, uh, um, yes. Uh, so the other thing I would note in there is that your, your bond payment is going down. Uh, so that's reflected in there. And there's reflected the level the same level of transfer to the capital fund that you've had in years past. So we didn't change, it says zero, but it, you see right beside it, it says 437,000. That's what we've been transferring to the capital fund from the general budget. Bond payment's going down 22,000. 22, 22, yeah. Is this the last year? Or? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wait, that FY budget FY reflects the last year. No, FY21 is the, the year without it. I think there's next two, year we have. Bonds, right? We have a bond payment in FY20, and I've got to look at FY21. It's right on the verge, of, right it. on the yeah, verge of there. So we can get you. We can get you the bond schedule. It's okay. So do you want to say more, Kari, from finance committee? Was there anything? Um, well, in terms of one one important thing in terms of the content, I asked. Um, if this budget does anything to, does it provide anything um, that might significantly improve student learning in keeping with goal number two of the SU board? And the response you might have been able to predict was no, but money is not what's needed necessarily to improve student learning. It's more about practices, which is a, co a topic we'll return to, but I just wanted to make sure that that's we're thinking along those lines when we think about our, about our budget. And if you look at page seven, we sent you this in the packet the way this is broken out. It's broken out in departments and methods that we've used in every, in previous budgets for many, many years. At the Finance Committee, we had a discussion around changing it so it was centered around the student learning outcomes. An example would be social studies, global citizenship, and world language would be under the global citizenship. 
because one of the things that uh, the finance committee has been good about asking is how do we link the resources to our student learning outcomes? So we actually, Kari, we had one this morning, but I frankly just didn't get it here. Oh. That reorganized us around the student learning outcomes instead of what we're the traditional. To do it that way. Instead so of the traditional next, departments. Next time we'll. So we'll have that for you in December. And I'll bring you a, Stevens Crave it, I'll bring you a, a tree diagram instead of using your favorite word. A crosswalk. A crosswalk. I can live with that. You can live with that? Okay. That would take, take you, how do I know from which departments went into which in the news, in the new, because one of the other big things is academic services. So things like library, guidance, health services, those are academic services for kids. So we want to, we were talking about putting those together and we actually, right around the table there, I think, I think Karen, Carrie, you had left at that point, but Laura, Steve and I sat there and said, okay, how would this go together? Good. I actually have that. I just have a quick question about English and literacy dropped way down. It just seemed mm -hmm. almost like you're losing a teacher. Really? Although uh, it um, went from 978 to 927. That's the projected for this right, year. Right, projected um, for this year and then budget for next so year. So part of this year is we have the Roland Fellowship with, um, with uh, Alden Bird. And so he is, we hired a full-time teacher to replace him, but the um, we still pay him. It's so we get seventy-five thousand dollars from the Roland Fund, but it doesn't cover the full teacher salary. Um, and, and it so, doesn't show up. So in this we line. picked up. We essentially picked up part of Alden's salary and the salary of the person who is um, is taking his classes while he's on his fellowship. Okay. So it will drop back because we don't have that person next year. Alden's back in the classroom. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. And I think it's also important to recognize that there's a lot of assumptions at this early stage, and one of the biggest ones is around the revenues, you know, and what what will actually be the number of students and, and all of that. This that's subject to change as we go through different drafts of this. Do people have questions? And what are you looking for from us tonight? Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about the next few meetings and, and how we might um, communicate and involve folks in, in this process. So we have a meeting on November 28th, just a regular U32 meeting, um, which I guess we'll be looking at draft two. Yep. Um, we, December 5th, um, we have a carousel meeting. So why do we have our meeting November 28th? Because Thanksgiving is the third Wednesday, happens to be the way this month falls, is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Isn't November 28th the carousel meeting? Nope. No. It's no. December 5th. Do we usually meet twice in December, in November? We have been. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. okay. December okay. For budget. Got it. So that's just U32. Okay, I'm glad I asked. Um, I think that'll be good to look at the second draft. Um, so December 5th is a carousel, we'll meet afterwards. But we were thinking that December 19th would be um, probably our best opportunity to invite people in and treat it somewhat like a budget forum. We could do a presentation and then take feedback, if that made sense to you. And then January 2nd, we could potentially be ready to, well, I mean, that's getting ahead of ourselves. We don't even know if we're gonna be. Right, this. right, yep, but that's our next meeting. Those meetings are close together in terms of how many work days are in between. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Really close together. And it might be, I mean, my suggestion to the board might be to go over a little bit more on the 28th and then on the 5th, have time to think about it and come back with any direction on the 5th. Okay. That was kind of it, Karen. Did you think of anything else? No. And so, what would it look like on the 28th? We'll what, bring you what the, you... the budget basically um, reconfigured to SLOs. Probably it will not have a bottom line change to it. Um, we, you know, we're once we get into December, then we'll start to get to equalize pupils. Okay. And what that's starting to look okay. like, and what that looks like for excess spending. Um, 
and we'll probably be bringing it to you at that point we may be looking at how that flows into if merged how that flows into an overall budget for the SU do we have the transfer of fund balance to our capital budget as part of this meeting doesn't look like it's on the no, action. No, because we had already no. warned this one before we had the finance okay. committee so we'll had met. Okay, I just wanted to mention that um, Scott, who couldn't be at the finance committee meeting or tonight, did email some different points that he wanted raised. And maybe the most significant one, the one that got my attention, was using a portion of our fund balance to reduce the total tax impact. And we discussed that yesterday, and the recommendation is going to be to use the excess fund balance in excess of the 4% reserve um, and allocate that for the track so that we can get that done in 2020, actually next summer. So that would not leave anything um, to reduce the tax impact as Scott requested. And his thinking was that the following year the debt service will be less so we wouldn't have to make up that money in the budget the following year. Right. Was that a... That was, was, that that was, was his thinking. Yeah, yeah. We didn't... We um, didn't yeah, we kind yeah. of left it at the, at the track. So but. he said 3.1% for next year's budget is not easily defense, defensible before voters, um, especially in light of our recent history of fund balance surpluses. I'm not... That was his comment. Um, and then he had questions about instructional school-wide and other instructional programs. Yeah, that's this category business and... Um, Will that come clearer? I don't know. I mean, we're going to recategorize, so it may, may become less clear. But I think, mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit forest for the trees. We should be looking at the bottom line, not where individual yeah. things are allocated. Um, I mean, some of, these, some of these categories have been somewhat fluid um, in terms of, you know, Office of the Superintendent having special education services and things like that. So. Right, added into it. Um, and when you do the reconfigured budget, it might be helpful to have Office of the Superintendent and have it broken out. It's it's special ed. It's transport. You know, it will be three. We presented to the executive committee that the Washington Central Assessments will have an Office of the Superintendent, transportation services, special education services, and that's following. There's new handbook two guidance in how we produce and have to categorize all our budgets coming from the agency of education that we have to, so we've gone to what okay. they're saying we have to transfer to in the next year. Okay. So that, that's what we presented to the executive committee last time. Great. Other questions? Carl, you good with this? Karen? Okay. Diversity, inclusion, and equity belief statement, which is on page 17. And the hope is that we can adopt this this evening. It has right. There was happened. one change, and I looked at this recently, but... Do you remember what it is? It was, Scott had suggested that we shorten one of the bullets, the third bullet, I believe, all students... Oh, that's right. Through. We took away yeah. all we those words. More mm -hmm. complex language. Yep. Drop the word pernicious. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And just to remind us, so this isn't a policy, it's just a statement of beliefs that could be used as the basis for evaluating a diversity policy if and when we want to take up that work. Uh, Bill was counseling us that we might want to not rush that process. Are people okay with this? Mm -hmm. Let's just adopt it right now. So is there a motion to accept the, to adopt the diversity, inclusion, and equity belief statement as written in version four? So Carl? Second. Second. Karen? Any more comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. That's great. Thank you for your work on that. That's great. I'm going to skip over the flag policy. Krista Dye, D. D, I always say it's it wrong, okay. is doing teacher conferences and she wanted to come. She thought she'd be here at 7. Okay. So we'll okay. just, we can go through these reports and when she comes, we'll go back to it. Um, Central Vermont Career Center. We heard a little bit last meeting. 
So George, Stephen, and I were present. Um, and they, uh, to really just give you the short version, uh, there was a lot of discussion about what needed to be done. And there was support for a very uh, a smaller uh, vision and program development, maybe exploration and, and needs analysis. And needs analysis to be done, um, and to try to do that uh, this year so that there could be a plan for where is so Central Vermont Career Center could really look at what's the direction they're trying to have they're going. And then, if they if that once they have that, what do they need to support that moving forward? So uh, that that changed oh, about a week and a half ago. It was the last Monday of October. Um, I think it was a good meeting. I think folks really got to understood and, and understood where there was very there was a lot more clarity about how the proposal came to start to look at a new building, and that with a, a step back to saying let's look and see what the needs are of the students and how many, they've had, a, a, as everyone has in education in Vermont, a big drop in student enrollment. There, I think they're like, is it 170 or 150, is there, are there numbers now? I was thinking 160 was the number that I'd heard last. Yeah, so somewhere in that area. Um, and I can remember just five or six years ago, they were over 200 students. So. Thanks. In the next meeting, are they Is making in, them so you guys? Yes, can they, did. they did. They did rearrange their schedule. Great. So we have those on our schedule. December. December, I think. I'd have to go through my notebook. Frankly. Yeah, I didn't even put yes, it on my calendar yet. So it's a good reminder. Great. Reports to the board, Central Vermont Career Service. I think we just heard it. Mm -hmm. Students. All right. Um, so you just heard from the student council. Um, but this weekend is um, Little Shop of Horrors. So our theater program has been here until nine o'clock, pretty much every night this week, um, working to make the play happen. So there's gonna be showings on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. They're doing a student last night for us, during last band. And cross country, one girl from the team and the entire boys team is going to, or the varsity, Boys team is going to New England this weekend on Saturday, and so they'll be in Manchester. Uh, that include you? Yes. yes. Well, Congratulations. And then also, um, as you guys knew, because of Krista, parent-teacher conferences are happening tonight, so a lot of teachers uh, have to stay late today, um, but those are super helpful. Uh, winter sports are all starting to get rolling too. Um, and then also. Next week, there is um, a field trip for the green team to the Youth Climate Leader Academy um, at, I believe it's at Holbert, um, and it's an overnight, I'm pretty sure, um, so the green team's going to that. Is that just students, or is that? Um, just students, right? Well, and maybe they're, they're advisors. Yeah. 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 You just give them the keys to the, <laughs> <laughs> the van. We just send them on their way. <laughs> but it's a student group. Mm -hmm. Yes. Green team is a student. And on Monday and Tuesday, there were some students from the athletic teams, and they were at an athletic leadership conference Monday and Tuesday. And then um, last week, was that? I think it was last week. We also had Sweethearts and Heroes come, and it was um, this presentation about um, bullying and like what causes it and also how to stop it, which I really enjoyed. I thought it was super interesting and definitely different than other presentations that I'd seen, so that was good. And, all the, did the middle schoolers see it too? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So middle schoolers and high schoolers saw it. But yeah, that's basically what's been happening at school right now. Thanks. Questions for that? What's mm -hmm. next to your administration? So I would add that we had our sports dessert last night, and one of our own, Lucy Wood, um, received the. <laughs> you could have said that for her. Yes. <laughs> she had a little reward last night. So um, congratulations. She and Andrew yeah. Prompton actually were our two recognized students last night. Congratulations. That's Thank great. You. It's quite an honor. Yeah. So, so our outstanding student athletes and. Um, yeah, I think I think they mentioned most of the activities that were going on um, right now. I mean, we're since I last saw you guys, it's just pretty much 
been filled with those things that, that the, the kids were just talking about. Um, I, I think there was one, you wanna? Yeah, Meg Allison just let us know that she won a grant um, for some money to bring in some speakers for seeking social justice. Great. Okay. Yeah. And we also, um, I, I, um, I'm participating, uh, Bill and I actually are, um, with Jim Knight. Uh, there's a conference that's over in uh, Colchester um, that was today and tomorrow. And um, so we're with a group of teachers from throughout the supervisory union um, and, uh, and working on uh, coaching and coaching strategies and presentation strategies. Um, and so uh, I would say that's, that's been really good. But I, I would add that on my ride up, one of the teachers that, that, we carp that I carpooled with um, was reminding me a group of our teachers went to uh, uh, Ta-Nisi Coates last mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, do, you weren't able to. No, no it, it was the sports dessert. It, the so sports dessert, dessert interfered yeah. with some of our kids going. But we did have one student go as well. Um, and uh, it was just a presentation over at UVM. He's an author, if you know. Um, and uh, they were super energized by some of the things that he was talking about. I don't know what they were saying in the school today, but I know that those. I know Jen was, this, was energized. Yeah. What, has he, what has he written? Um, Between the world and me. He writes, he writes about um, racism and also just race in America. He's really good. We read him in um, Advance Expo last year, and it definitely changed my perspective about a lot of things. Also, the case for reparations yeah. is a mm -hmm. in the Atlantic. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and he's written a couple other things as well. Okay. So, I don't know if there are any other questions. I mean, questions. <laughs> yeah. I would just add that we have probably about uh, probably about twelve to fifteen teachers from the SU in this PD in the professional development oh, yeah, that yeah. you're talking about for coaching. Uh, it's pretty much anyone that does yeah. some sort of peer to coaching support for teachers. It's a big undertaking to take that many at once out of the system. Yeah, oh, yeah. no kidding. That's yeah. a lot of subs. And, and, and <laughs> five administrators up there. So those are five. Of us. Yeah, three central office and two principals. So. Wow. Finance committee. Do you have any more to add? I don't think so. We're gonna. Well, there's the financial report. It's in the packet. Yep. What was that? It's on page 19. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it, you basically covered it prior when you said, you know, we have this extra over the 4%, yeah. 500,000. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's anything else. What, um, what are all these slides in the packet? Was that? That was, it, it, what it was, was the multi year budget and looking at it, and uh, Adrian and I were looking at it earlier. I want to check this again okay. and make sure it's the right multi year budget because it, it has some, some questions on it. So I'll get that cleared up okay. in the next the ones that what, said what, town Why is East Montpelier? Well, that's why that's, I, that's I called. She asked, and I asked, asked and said, She asked me last night, and since I was, I was at, it. The, up in yeah. Colchester with the professional development, I didn't have a chance to talk okay. to Lori. All right. So I will get that cleared up. So we don't know if it's the wrong title or it's just East Montpelier and it's in the wrong packet. Yeah, table it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we'll was no the right action on that. Good evening. Um, where are we here? Executive committee. Yeah. You okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. So we um, met last night at a special meeting to discuss the first version of the SU budget, which Bill mentioned is coming in at two percent or less. Um, although there is interest in potentially adding a a job coach, so we're keep you apprised of that. Um, <coughs> special coach. Um, let's see, Act 46. Um, we have a subcommittee that's working on draft articles of agreement, bylaws, and we had a productive session yesterday and plowed through the easy half of them, and then we'll continue working on that. Um, if there's a forced merger, that would eventually. The thinking is that we would not use the default, but our, we would pro propose our own version within 90 days of the uh, plan, which is by February, some, some time, more yeah. March, early March. Um, and there's another committee, subcommittee working on debt, but I don't they have any meet tomorrow afternoon. Yeah. 
which would, which would be one of the articles, or we relate to at least one of the articles, but uh, it's definitely the, the trickiest one. Um, also, updated. We had a we had a group that met a couple times with the folks from Twinfield, but I think that's been suspended since the agency, or no, the board had a provisional ruling that Twinfield will should go to the Caledonia, Caledonia North Central, North Central. With, with Danville. Yeah. Um, and then. Let's see, it's been a little bit since we've had a regular executive committee meeting, but I know we're making, we're continuing to work on our three goals, reviewing um, governance um, models. We're going to continue doing that this month. Um, the school quality committee is going to meet next week and talk about a, a goal for learning. Goal number two. and Communi Communication is the other one. Community engagement. Yeah, and I can't, I've got nothing on that. Um, that's all that I can think of right now. Executive committee, do you? I don't have much to add. I think you covered it. Matthew, anything? Questions for Kari? Thank you for doing that. That's Bu a lot of work. Busy lately. time. Yeah, mm -hmm. you've been meeting a lot for that. Policy committee canceled their meeting because it conflicted with negotiations That's and right. we're going to meet in December. Yep. And school quality is meeting next, next Thursday. Next week. It'll be our we'll first chance to debrief it. on the student learning outcome report and, and then talk about is there a goal that we can re recommend for the next SU board meeting. And negotiations? We've just begun to get started. We had an initial gathering, which was a training in the IBB process, the interspace bargaining process, um, designed to remind us all how it works and bring the new folks up to speed on how, how, how the process functions. Um, and um, yeah, we've got, yeah, I knew that, yeah. <laughs> That's I, missed the last, I, missed, I missed the last one because it was at 7.30 in the morning, not 7.30 at the night. Um, that was. We're going to get you home early so that, you can go tomorrow yeah, yeah. <laughs> morning. So we've got that was a planning meeting with the, admin, with the administration team, um, and we've got another one the following week, fifteenth, I think, sixteenth, sixteenth, um, and then we will start the process. And after that, the twenty sixth, twenty sixth is when we start. Whatever the first Monday is. First Monday, Monday yeah. yeah. I'm doing it out of Great. It was a good team. Looked good. promising. Good. Great. I'm glad you're doing the same process again. <clears throat> Questions for Carl? Thank you very much for doing that. Action agenda. We've done the diversity. We're going to hold off on flag policy until we've run out of other things to do. <laughs> um, there is a bid for an elevator that was on page 22. Is there a motion to accept the bid for $145,000 from Bay State Elevator? So moved. And a second? Carl. Discussion? Anyone want to give us any <clears throat> background on this? So it's an elevator modernization um, proposal bid that we're accepting. So, uh, <laughs> so the, uh, it's the elevator that's in the uh, atrium that goes between the middle school, the atrium, and the second floor. It, it's just seen its... It's temperamental. Yeah, it's temperamental at best. Um, so we just need to get it... Um, re there's a lot of work that needs to be done, as, as you can tell by the price tag, but it's part of our capital budget plan. And so it's, um, it falls within the um, estimates that we already had for it. There's only one company that bid. Really? Did we invite the bid? <laughs> um, three, or three or yeah, I think there were three companies that we contacted, and Bay State had to be. We had to contact them all again, and Bay State's the only one that came through. They're they're pretty much the only place that will service elevators in this state. Do they do they actually serve us? Yeah. We need maintenance. Yeah, when we need maintenance, we call Bay State. Yeah. And Dallas. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. We have an end of year retirement. Sandy Shalou, she's on top of it here. Is there a motion to accept her retirement at the end of the school year? 
So moved. Carl and a second. Sorry, Karen. Um, how long has she been here? I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> I can speak to that. She taught me his, uh, how to drive. Oh my God. <laughs> she was a student teacher wow. her first year. Wow. So do you want to tell us how many years ago that was? 84. Or not? 84, 94, 2000, so 34 years. Yeah, she's been well, doing it for a while. Well, you know, um, I would like to say thank you. She has taught most of Central Vermont to drive <laughs> yeah, over the last that's 34 that's years. Stressful job. I just can't imagine doing that day in and day out. <laughs> she taught us to drive, too. Yeah. <laughs> she taught my kids to drive, too. <laughs> she actually was my daughter's TA. Um, all those in favor of accepting her retirement, say aye. 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 Opposed? And with great thanks for all that she's done yeah. for a very long time. It's good timing, because we're at the bottom of the agenda here. <laughs> um, do we have board orders? No. Are we supposed no. to? Well, um, <laughs> probably I'm not sure why they're not here. Well, we probably last because two weeks ago. we did Hold them. Because we met just two weeks ago. Yeah, but we often yeah, we have them. Oh, no, no, we changed. There's an internal change that happened, and it did not happen. So I'll make sure you have them at the next one. Uh, we usually they're put in my binder. It's a new change we started about six to eight weeks ago. Okay. To cut, we had so many extra hands, it was like, let's make this easier. So they aren't there. I would check where they are. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move back up to the discussion agenda, the flag policy. And last, actually two weeks ago, we looked at this flag policy, which is on page, thank you, 18. And I took it and made the changes that were asked for. Um, there were a few words that we took out a word, took out a word use and um, made the policy so it was just students that could um, ask the, uh, ask, request the board to fly a flag. And what else? I actually have, let me see the changes I made here. What were the other ones? There were a couple. Um, took out the word legitimate and just add, put in student groups. And that's about it. So this is the policy as set. The administration has procedures and we adopt the policy. And if people are happy with it, we can move to adopt it because it's been warned for that. We don't have to do a first reading. And we we did, did a first reading we last, first, that was last two yeah. weeks ago. Yep. And so we can adopt it today if there are no changes or no, you know, if we change a word or two, it's still okay. I guess I would voice that we had some discussion at the last meeting about uh, the future possibility of a second flag poll. Um, this policy doesn't really doesn't really deal with that because we don't have it yet, but I don't think it conflicts with it either. So I agree when I look at it, it yeah. just says basically flying. Yeah. It doesn't say where. And I guess maybe if in the future we had a second poll, we might want to revisit the policy to clarify how the second poll is going to be used versus the primary. Um, but for the time being, I think this policy serves as well. I think it looks promising. I was just looking at the procedures. <clears throat> So the procedures do say that the flags would be flown below the United States or Vermont flag or on a separate flagpole. If the way they're written right now. <clears throat> we, yeah. Are we in agreement that there should be a second flagpole? Or are we? I don't think we've actually discussed it as a board. It was brought up, the administration brought it up as a discussion in the administration about putting a second flagpole in. And the, what I remember hearing is that the thought is they would put in a taller flagpole. 
yeah. where the U.S. and Vermont flag would fly. Yeah. So when it went to half mass, <clears throat> there wasn't any problem. And then this, the present flagpole would be for other flags. Is that correct? That is the the part, thought part of the thoughts. Yes, the thoughts. <clears throat> Yeah, I guess, I mean, I, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. It came up last time. Do you want to say something? Or are no, you just... I'm just pouring over trying to pour it Yeah, <laughs> and I'm wondering about Krista. No, um, as far as, like, in regards to the second flight fall? Or as, as far as the, rule. the policy, because oh, no, we don't we don't really get to vote on the second flag. <laughs> not, not <laughs> That's not really, you know. We've got we've set a policy, and then they these guys us. get to, get to carry out the policy. Yes. Uh, I think the policy looks great. I think it looks like a fair policy. Thank you. Are you guys here for that? Yeah. I was here for the whole thing in the beginning, but I didn't realize it was at six, so I apologize. <laughs> oh, which thing at the beginning? <laughs> Uh, Which I was enjoying learning about it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you missed a great presentation by the student council. <laughs> uh, the only thing that I could see is that if you adopt it and leave it the way you have it, it leaves it a, a loophole of if and when a flagpole is done. So I don't really like the way that's handled. We, I thought of that as well, but we could we could just hold off on accepting a request till the second flagpole is. Or we need to move forward. <laughs> we have other things in agendas. We've got a new, <laughs> new person here. <laughs> I think we would just sort of deal with you know figure it out if we don't have the flagpole. But we, the, we do. The other thing too is no one brought up again. What the Constitution laws are, and if you would have a lawsuit for putting something below that, putting something below the the American flag is like that what you're flag referring flag. to? Depends on what you want to read. And if someone has enough money to get a good enough lawyer to want to fight it, I mean. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Yeah. <laughs> cross it too far. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not saying to me, but I mean, yep. there's enough people that you could start something. Mm -hmm. So I think the easiest thing to do is put a flagpole and be done and move this away and then let separate sides, you know, do their thing. And then they could form their own committee and group and and then approve what can go on the flag. And, is it wet? <laughs> More discussion? So the last thing on the agenda is to accept this policy. So is there a motion to accept the flag policy as written? So moved. Carl and a second? Second. Karen? More discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We have a flag policy. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. You wrote it. Yep. <laughs> With no, no examples out there. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's my new job. <laughs> policy writing. I can tell you there are two superintendents or boards that are looking for what we adopted. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Great. And Montpelier does not have a flight they policy yet. I called them. And they do not. And I have not. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, future agenda items. So the next meeting is on um, November 20. Eighth at yep. six, six o'clock. It's just the U32 board meeting. Yeah, so when we have just the U32 board, we meet at six. When we have the full board first, we meet at either seven or seven thirty, depending on how long that agenda is. And it's confusing. I apologize. Um, so I would say there are two items that, we, and we'll make sure they get on there, but just so the board's aware, one of them is the uh, capital transfer. Um, so from the budget to um, the fund balance to capital for the track project. And then we also have um, a contractor pre-qualification criteria that the board will need to approve for the track bid to be done because the 
entirety of the project is greater than $500,000. And so the, we have to do some other steps that we didn't have to do with something like the elevator. That the board has to The take board part has in. to actually yeah. Yeah. do yeah. a couple of things. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll be in November, and yeah, we'll, we'll also have sure the budget. But those will be action items yep. that we'll have on there, just so the board's working. Great. If you think there would be questions um, in working with John Helmgard from Blackbird Design, who's, our, who's been the architect helping us with this, and he would be better than our civil engineer firm that's doing the RFP. If there were questions about this process, I'm sure we could probably get John or one of his associates here. He's helped us at the three schools we've done, two of the schools we've done renovations. So do you think about. we need him in November, or would we need him at another meeting in the future? It's about the pre -qual This is actually the most important step right now is the pre-qualifications, because once you set those pre-qualifications, you go out to bid, and the way the law reads, you have to accept the lowest bidder without any judgment unless a bid, unless two bids or more are within 1% of the overall cost of the budget. So what happened, the pre-qualifications is more important than the final step because this is where you say this is what we want in companies and what type of companies we want to build a project this big. And they have to certify to that level before they're even allowed to come in and bid on the project. Because Vermont construction law is very specific. You <coughs> must. It's not like other uh, procurement laws that we have in the state of Vermont. You must take the lowest bidder. So if they meet the minimum criteria, then you go with a low bid. You, have, you know, they got to you can get into bid. They've they got to meet, meet the criteria, right. and, and then, then from there you've got to go to the lowest bid. I would love to have him come. Yeah, I was, I'm hey. curious how you'll present this information to us, like what yeah, our options yeah. are. Yeah, yeah so yep. we, I think we could John, we could have John here. He's excellent at doing yeah. that work. And I ask that this be included in the packet ahead of time, so at least we can yeah, look at I have a that. clue about what we're talking about. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> a small clue. A yeah, small yeah, one, yeah. But John's a pro John this. and uh, Bill Ford right. drafted this. Yeah. As yeah. A, they're, they're and they could come right at 6 if they wanted, or if that didn't work, I will you know, check with John. figure out what works for them. Yeah. We could put them first yeah. if they wanted to do that. Board communication. We held off last meeting yeah. thinking that we should do it this meeting. Um, you want me to take a stab at it? You want to do that? That would be great. Okay. Thanks. I think I did the last couple. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, terrific. Anything else? We're adjourned. <laughs>